So today's webinar is co-hosted by the McMaster Demystifying Medicine Program, a program designed to help increase the understanding of how advances in biology can be applied to human disease and discusses frequently emerging scientific, medical, and ethical areas of public interest. Our guest speaker, Dr. Kaminsky, is the Boehringer Ingelheim Endowed Professor of Internal Medicine and the Chief of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at the Yale School of Medicine. He received his medical degree and training in Israel and received his basic training in Dean Shepherds and with Roche. He has been very active within the ATS community and recently served as the chair of the ATS Assembly on Respiratory Cell and Molecular Biology. His main research interests involves genomic approaches to understand disease with a focus on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, a disease characterized by progressive scarring of the lungs and a need of cure, and in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, severe asthma and sarcoidosis. Leading the Kaminsky Lab at the Yale School of Medicine, he collaborates with researchers to apply cutting edge technologies that measure changes in the sequence, expression or regulation of all the genes in the human genome in efforts to learn more about the roles of genome networks and biomarkers in chronic lung disease. These studies have led to a greater understanding of pulmonary fibrosis, as well as many additional insights, including the realization that aberrant activ activation of developmental pathways is at the core of lung fibrosis, the discovery of the role of microRNAs in IPF, along with the identification and validation of novel prognostic biomarkers in the bloodstream. It has also led to the creation of the IPF Salatlas, um, an online free dissemination tool. We are honored to have Dr. Kaminsky here today to demystify pulmonary fibrosis with single cell RNA sequencing. Um, so uh, thank you for uh, the invite. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, as I, I'm really uh, excited about this opportunity. I, would have preferred to spend some time with my friends and uh, colleagues and collaborators at McMaster, but uh, um, remote talks are completely okay for me. I'm starting to love them. I do want to start, before I start my talk, I, I want to mention that uh, as uh, researchers, uh, um, healthcare workers, physicians who are focused on the well-being of humans, you know, these are unique times and um, um, while uh, much of my research is focused on the idea of curing lung disease, I think that all of us need to be engaged with curing the health of society. So, um, you know, we've all been uh, uh, dealing with a pandemic in the last three months. This is why we're speaking in this forum. And some of the anomalies of our societies and leaderships have made this pandemic worse and more recently the emergence of, uh, again, Black Lives Matter, so exemplify how we cannot be silent. Uh, and um, even if the world was perfect and there was no inequality, uh, war or violence, life would be difficult with disease and eventually death. Um, and that's what physicians and researchers find but this also means that we really need to fight inequality and injustice because they magnify suffering, unnecessary disease and death, and it's all connected. So today I'll, uh, um, um, this is sort of my disclosure. I'm a consultant for multiple uh, companies uh, um, and um, have um, industry collaborations and patents. Um, so today I'll speak very quickly about IPF give a background of the disease I've mostly studied. I will say, why do we actually, why has my career focused on RNA? Then give a brief uh, instruction about the lessons for what we learned from bulk analysis of tissues of patients with pulmonary fibrosis, and then go into our discussion of single cell RNA-seq, the sort of exciting novel technology. The people is sort of the um, um, Upper uh, left circle are many of the people that contributed this, and I'll, I'm showing it now because, again, it's hard to sometimes mention every single person. It is a teamwork, and when you um, listen to my voice, you want to remember that uh, I'm actually representing a, a chorus of investigators 
and of course of intellects and brains who put a lot of effort to doing this work. And I'll try and mention some of the names as, as we go along. Um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a basic progressive form of fibrotic interstitial lung disease, meaning a scarring of the lung of unknown uh, reason. Um, it is defined by the exclusion of known causes of lung disease. There's around 200,000 patients in the US, 6 million worldwide. There's a sort of a typical presentation of the disease, both on imaging on high resolution CT and on pathology. And what you want to remember is relatively simple. One is the incidence increases with age. At certain ages, it's more common than most cancer. It is extremely rare below the age of 55. The median survival is three years, so this is a really bad disease. But the range is actually could go up to 10 or 12 or 13 years. So some patients do have a very stable course. Um, 30,000 deaths a year in the US, 1% of the deaths in the UK based on one of the recent reports. The only curative treatment is lung transplantation. Immunosuppression kills patients with IPF. There's now two FDA approved drugs. Many more are coming uh, and there's a strong genetic component. When I started getting interested in pulmonary fibrosis actually around 20 years ago, it was considered a stable, stable invariably progressive disease with a large component of inflammation, and that the disease was defined by sort of fibroblast proliferation response to inflammation. And in general, it wasn't thought of a career-making disease. It was thought that this is just a, the lung is a fibrotic sac, and you will never be able to reverse fibrosis. You just need to suppress inflammation. So 2020 comes and we learned that um, as in other things, many of the sort of authorities are wrong. And actually in the terms of pulmonary fibrosis, we learned that there's a very complex phenotype of the lung. The lung is highly active. This is the active process of remodeling. And I'll get back to it when we show some of the data. With myofibroblasts active cells, a strong genetic component, um, um, importance of mitochondria, telomere, developmental pathways like Wnt and microRNAs, the arteries. And we definitely learned that immunosuppression of inflammation kills our patient. And, um, you know, when we learned. The other thing is that, again, um, pulmonary fibrosis was a little bit in, in backwards. This is sort of a diagram in which I um, uh, basically did um, uh, plotted all the papers in PubMed, normalized to their baseline in 2002. And basically the uh, dashed line is, is PubMed. And as you see, sort of cancer drives publications. But what is impressive is that papers related to IPF really take off dramatically. And if you look at some other field, um, diabetes, uh, coronary heart disease, they all sort of perform around PubMed. But IPF, we almost six doubled the number of papers. And a lot of it has to do with the, sort of the major findings of the genetics of the disease, and then sort of the approved drugs disease. And then we saw this exponential growth in, uh, uh, in publications and high quality publications. So pulmonary fibrosis is really a hot topic, a hot type of scientific topic. Um, what happens in IPF? So this is basically your a typical uh, pathology of IPF, normal adjacent lung adjacent to uh, areas of remodeling with myofibroblasts, foci, and sort of change the epithelial cells at the top of the myofibroblast foci. And this will recur when, when I start speaking about single cell data. And our model of the disease is basically what I call the IPF GIF, in which we have recurring micro injuries causing epithelial cell injury, a failure to recover from this injury leads to uh, ac activation of fibroblasts and uh, epithelial cells, matrix remodeling. And when the matrix becomes stiff, the process becomes basically irreversible and progressive with cell proliferation and migration until we get this usual interstitial pneumonia lesion. And of course, there has to be a genetic predisposition there has to be exposure. And what we've learned in the most recent years, there has to be telomere attrition. So why study RNA? That's actually really simple. Basically, no matter what happens to the cell, no matter any signal that you get, any single transaction pathway that you have will end up in the nucleus and result 
and changes in transcription of RNA. So basically, if the cell seems to see something, the RNA says something. Again, RNA doesn't give you data of the cell has made, but it gives you the information about what is the cell feeling? What does it know? What are the dangers or opportunities it faces? So what did we learn? And as I started my career with the emergence of microarrays, the first thing we did was take a chunk of IPF1, basically grind it, extract the RNA, sort of look at gene expression. And this is sort of the first paper that I uh, published on analysis of human IPF lungs um, in 2002. And basically that paper turned out to be extremely informative. Uh, we looked at the expression of 6,000 genes, um, um, found, actually looked only at eight samples and found um, changes in extracellular matrix and epithelial cell. And one of the things that we found was something that at the time was counterintuitive, upregulation of matrix metalloproteases. And we looked and we, sh um, the matrix metalloprotease we focused was MMP7, a small MMP that degrades casein, proteoglycans, and fibronectin, a wind beta catenin target uh, gene that promotes epithelial cell migration of ketosis. Um, and basically, we have seen that MMP7 is increased in IPF lungs. Uh, knockouts are relatively protected. It's highly expressed in epithelial cells in IPF. And as you can see, for staining, sort of in these dense fibrotic areas. And it's one of the most validated biomarkers so far in pulmonary fibrosis. High MMP7 in the blood usually is indicative of death. Later, we went on, and of course, we didn't do studies of only eight samples. And this is a heat map of uh, 571 patients. Every row is a gene, every column is a patient, yellow is increased, purple is decreased, and you have COPD, IPF, other interstitial lung disease and controls in there. And what you can see is that there's a big chunk that the IPF lung, you don't need to be an informatician, is very different from control. And when uh, we look at these signal, what we see is this change in uh, increased matrix metalloproteases as we saw before with MMP7 increase, uh, change in developmental pathway, mostly wind beta catenin, sonic hedgehog, evidence for TG beta downstream effects, shift in epithelial cell phenotypes, enrichment for targets for microRNAs, and many, many potential biomarkers. And this has been really uh, summarized well by um, 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 uh, Milica Mirovic um, a couple of years ago. Um, um, and the types of uh, genes, their validations, and the changes of expression. The same goes for microRNAs in the IPF lung. This is the heat map of all microRNAs in the IPF lung. You see the numbers of control, COPD, IPF, and other interstitial lung diseases. And again, there's a really big difference. 10% of the transcriptome is differentially expressed. And when we look at that, microRNAs seem to be form a sort of a TJ beta centric. Uh, um, transcriptional network. The first microRNA we studied and described was LED7, that is uh, down-regulated in epithelial cells, and it's probably a regulator of an EMP-like phenotype in these cells. Uh, this was uh, published long ago. And more recently, we focused on MIR-29. MIR-29, you may call it the uh, um, universal fibromir, uh, anti-fibromir. It's decreased in liver, kidney, heart fibrosis, targets extracellular matrix, proteins. It's been shown in almost every organ when you give MIR-29 in a fibrotic model, you reverse fibrosis, including pulmonary fibrosis. And most recently, our group, well, uh, Mauricio Kukoli, has shown that uh, um, uh, you can reverse fibrosis in human precision cut lung slices. We have an ongoing collaboration with Mirogen about developing an, an under an NIH and HLBI drug development program, cadet program to basically develop MIR-29 mimicry as a therapy for IPF. Well, what about large non-coding RNAs? You already can guess the shape of the, uh, 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 of the heat map. Um, here, every row is a large non-coding RNA. Every column, again, is a patient. IPF patients control COPD under interstitial lung disease, and we actually see that around 10% of the large encoding RNA transcripts are differentially expressed. And my group focused on one large encoding RNA fender that I'll mention a word about it that was decreased in the IPF lung. And when you inhibit fender in cells, 
you get a mixed phenotype of both myofibroblast uh, change and senescence. Uh, we did a lot of work to understand it. It is the most decreased large encoding RNA in IPF tissue. It is decreased in IPF fibroblasts. Its expression goes down with age. Remember the connection with age. It in, its innovation uses a senescent phenotype with myofibroblast characteristic in fibroblasts. Um, um, and it, knockouts have a spontaneous prophybrotic uh, uh, phenotype. And what is interesting is actually that Fender is an um, epigenetic regulator of gene expression. So Fender basically binds its steady state to the PRC2 uh, inhibitory uh, complex. When Fender goes down, the repression of promoters goes down and the repression of the P16 promoter goes down. And thus, if you have, uh, uh, um, um, and the same thing for GATA6. And then when you have a stimulus that drives their expression, basically you have activation of their um, uh, target gene and progressive uh, fibrosis. This is unpublished data, but we hope to sort of connect the last dots and submit uh, as the pandemic moves. So what did we learn from bulk RNA? Uh, um, uh, uh, seek a lot of things. But the main thing, and actually if you read uh, 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 Melissa's paper, you will see there's a discussion about where are the changes happening? And what is the cell type that's happening? Um, and a lot of it is guesswork or no uh, or lack of basically recognition of our ignorance. So the other thing is the IPF lung is extremely variable. And if you look at the CT scan, you can see sort of that there are areas of normal lung and areas of uh, disease lung. So can you really study disease progression of humans? So in some ways you cannot because you're not going to do a biopsy twice in the same patient. But we, um, and again, the tissue is really temp uh, characterized by spatial and temporal heterogeneity with normal appearing of velar structure adjacent to transitional uh, zones and to advanced scar tissue. So what uh, uh, we did, and this is uh, through a collaboration with uh, uh, the Catholic University at Leuven, uh, um, and a project run by John McDonough uh, is basically that we um, apply to a unique resource inflated uh, frozen lung explants. These explants are basically uh, are inflated and frozen. They're cut into slices. These slices are cored and uh, the cores are actually uh, undergo micro CT and then score. So now you can actually quantitate their level of involvement in the disease. And um, if you take a, a lung and you could look, you could see actually uh, this distribution. And if you go from uh, the lower panel from left to right, you can see how a lesion is progressing in the same lung from structurally normal lung to end stage uh, uh, lung disease. Um, you could also measure uh, things and alveolar surface density is basically the ratio of alveolar surface area to prime to prime chimal volume is a good uh, measure of uh, fibrosis. Uh, as the uh, surface density goes down, the Ashcroft support, which is a pathological measure of uh, fibrosis, goes down. So we developed this project together um, with Bart Bandas and uh, Vin Boyds and John McDonald and uh, Jim Hall on actually um, taking the samples, doing quantitative histology, doing RNA-seq, microRNA profiling, pathological assessment, and global methylation. And um, uh, this is an interesting thing. So if you look at the here, you can see if we uh, do a principal component analysis of the samples of control, IPF, and, uh, uh, and IPF lung, you will see that basically based on the density, all the control-like samples sit in one cluster, all the severe IPF sit in one cluster. Then there's a cluster of samples that we call the IPF2, sort of intermediate. And there's a group of IPF samples that we call the IPF1 that are really overlapping with the control. And actually, when you look at them by pathology, they look extreme, but really similar to control. You can't really tell there's IPF. So, um, um, and this is just uh, an example of the images. And, uh, uh, when uh, John looked at did RNA-seq 
of all of these uh, samples, um, what they discovered was that although there was a really big difference between IPF3 and control, and or IPF2 in control, even IPF1, the samples that were indistinguishable from control, to, were different. And actually, there were 908 genes that are differentially expressed in all stages of an IPF, and we considered them a core set of genes. This is important because this implies early mechanisms of early disease. It's also important because this suggests that you could diagnose the disease, not necessarily by hitting an area of um, um, deep involvement. Uh, and this is sort of the core set of genes. Um, can we actually use this to learn regulatory networks? So we have a superb collaboration for many years with Zipart Joseph's group. And many years ago, we uh, 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 basically, uh, uh, his group developed a model, which is called the, dy uh, the dynamic regulatory event minor and when we applied the data using basically um, uh, controls as time point zero and um, IPF one as time point one, IPF two as time point two, and IPF three as time point three, we saw there were distinct tracks of gene expression uh, uh, that were distinguished, distinctly regulated in uh, the IPF line with some genes going up early. So between control and IPF1 and some going away. Um, this is an example. So uh, we could analyze using a Sankey plot and you can find it actually on, on the IPF cell atlas is that these gene expression tracks have distinct functional enrichment and regulation. So for instance, uh, the, um, uh, the track that goes up early is uh, uh, regulated by distinct transcription factors uh, and enrich for gene expression annotations of extracellular matrix and uh, uh, um, coordinations extracellular matrix and others. Um, so this is just to summarize how the tracks live. So basically track 1A and 1B are basically your classical fibrosis tracks. Um, track two is more of a lymphocyte immune response. That track three is more in ion channels, away development, uh, and um, um, the tracks that go down relate to interferon response, mitochondria, uh, monocytic response, blood vessel development and defense. Um, when we look at these tracks, and this is an example, so if we look at the track that goes up, uh, in the green, you can see uh, uh, the regulators of uh, uh, the first node distinguishing with what really goes, up, goes up late and early. The second is sort of the uh, second node. And what you can see that, for instance, many of the microRNAs, and I mentioned MIR-29 and LET7, they seem to be regulator of distinct stages of fibrosis. So it seems like MIR-29 goes down early and then stays down. So basically, it is a regulator of gene expression across the disease progressor, progression, potentially being a universal regulator, which is late 7 goes down later, potentially reflecting a secondary change in epithelial cells and epithelial uh, 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 phenotype. If you um, look for sort of things that we didn't know, so actually DREM identified clock genes as regulators of this path, same pathway. And it is interesting because as we were doing data mining, there were a set of papers that suggested circadian controls of the secretory pathways maintaining a collagen homeostasis. So this is sort of an unexpected validation of the model prediction, which is always cool. Um, we also found a completely novel regulator of, uh, of this pathway. This is power 2 af one which again showed up as a regulator of the um, uh, fibrosis pathway. power 2 f one is sort of a, uh, also called uh, OKB. Uh, it's a transcription activator expressed principally by B cell lymphocyte plays an essential role in these cell responses in antigen. Uh, and um, it's also found in the human airway uh, epithelial as a regulator of cause defense the genes. And uh, when we did staining, we saw a lot of pow 2 f one in the lymphocytic aggregates and increased B cell population to IPF lungs. From tissue, this work was done by Chin Lee and uh, uh, John McDonough. And you can see the single cell uh, data on the right. 
and when uh, um, Chinzi, together with a uh, uh, collaborator, Dean Tantin, who's our Rasa and Algeria Soplakis, um, did and so the knockout mice, the proud one, they showed that they had re reduced fibrosis, and we now have uh, targeted knockouts to the different cell types that we can distinguish uh, where about if one expression is involved. Um, so fibrosis progression within the human lung uh, definitely taught us about differentially regulated tracts in the uh, of gene expression, distinguish early and late uh, events with specific regulation. And you could almost say that we could um, order that the emergence of the of fibrotic lesion in the lung, uh, the movement between zero control and IPF1 minimal chain is basically upregulation of extracellular matrix and down regulation of immune with uh, um, regulation by uh, MIR-29. And then the progression is increase in attachment molecules, um, lymphocytic immunity, and uh, down regulation of mitochondrial. And the end stage is basically um, uh, upregulation of ciliary uh, uh, and chromosomal uh, organization. And this was published. And you can actually go to the IPF cell atlas and sort of pursue the model. Uh, if you point at your screen with your own phone and scan this QR code, it will get you into so the lessons from bulk transcriptomics is really that there's an amazing discovery potential. 10 or 15 percent of the lung transcriptomic differentially expressed. We have come up with distinct and validated mechanisms, new therapeutic targets, biomarkers, and conceptual insights. However, we cannot really address the sort of the complexity, the cellular complexity of the lung. So in the next 25 minutes, I'll try to share with you what we learned when we started doing single cell analysis of IGF lungs. And this is just the first phase when we did um, dissociated lungs. The next phase is actually microenvironment analysis and peripheral blood analysis. So again, the, sing the age of single cell prof profiling is really, um, compared to bulk transcriptomics, is basically moving from a handheld telescope to the Hubble telescope. Many things, we see many, many more things. We do confirm some of our prediction, but now we understand what the data is. So the rationale for um, single cell profiling is simple. Fibrosis is a disease of an organ, not a disease of a cell. An organ is a highly organized multicellular structure of our body that's self-contained. It has a specific vital function. And what the fibrosis is, is the permanent disruption of the normal structure of the organ, characterized by accumulation of extracellular matrix, normal cells, leading to loss of function. But it is this dysregulation of cellular discussion. So one of the things that we feel is that probably, if you look at one cell at a time and you understand it, you probably will be able to slow down fibrosis. We actually did it, but to stop fibrosis, or potentially to cure it, you need to reprogram the organ. You need to fix the interaction in the cell. And for this, you need to understand all the cellular changes happening in the organ, changes in resident and infiltrating cells, emerging in novel ectopic cell types, and altered cell cell communication through homostatic groups. And I'll just show a little bit of what we've learned recently. Uh, so the IPF cell atlas is uh, basically um, uh, a completely grassroots emergent effort of multiple independent groups that don't necessarily even coordinate with themselves uh, with the idea of uh, accelerating the developing of novel, accurate, and effective tools. Um, and um, the other thing that we generate is these beautiful three-dimensional images that their aim is actually just to hypnotize the audience. But now seriously, what you're looking at this sort of beautifully three-dimensional image is actually all the cells in the human lung uh, um, and clustered uh, based on their parameters, um, showing you the complexity and actually the difficulty of drawing sort of insights from uh, 2D images. And one of the critical things that we did in the IPF cell atlas and my group sort of took the lead of pulling all the data from the other group is we created a simple to use interface that allow exploration of human single cell atlas. Again, this is the QR code. Screen it with your iPhone, you basically do this. And um, um, 
uh, uh, and you have access to the IP itself. Uh, um, and this is sort of the data sets that are now uh, available. I won't go into this detail, but you can see the increased complexity of the information. I'm glad to say that um, uh, the, the two papers um, uh, posted uh, by archives by our group, uh, Ivan Rosas and my group, and uh, uh, Nick Panovich and uh, John Cropsey's group from Vanderbilt uh, and Tijen. Those two papers um, in their final version have now, I think, been accepted. Uh, so they will soon be um, available. However, I'll, uh, I'll show some uh, I'll results from our paper now. So what did we learn? So just a reminder, what our group, again, a fantastic collaboration with um, Ivan Rosas um, uh, and members of his group, especially Sergio Foley. And it was led in, on my group um, by um, 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 Taylor Adams and Yona Shoup and many other uh, um, uh, investigators, um, and also in collaboration with Umedi, all funded by the Three Lake Foundation uh, partners. And basically, we analyzed 79 human lungs, um, um, uh, 18 COPD, uh, 32 IPF, 28 controls, dissociated the lung, did single cell barcoding, sequenced them, and did computational analysis. And what you see basically is very simple which is when we cluster the cells, we can actually identify all the cells report, reported to be in the human lung based on previous papers. Um, um, these are sort of the clusters, uh, epithelial cells, uh, stromal cells, myeloid, and lymphoid, and based on these are the markers to use. When we, we use the combined um, uh, automated and uh, manual uh, uh, annotation, and we, um, uh, uh, basically, when we compared the automated and the manual cell annotations, we found that they were completely uh, um, consistent, um, though we feel that the manual cell annotations were tighter and also allowed us to identify novel cell signatures uh, that were not described before. Um, the data is very stable, so if we take the same data and uh, uh, of the same lungs, by single cell and then by bulk RNA seq and they convolute them. We see the same, basically the same substantial cellular population shift observed in the distal lung in IPF by single cell RNA seq and by bulk RNA seq. And also when we uh, did nuclear seq, although the relative um, uh, proportions of epithelial to um, immune cells to others change. The within cell population proportions actually are maintained. So the data is very stable. And the other cool thing is that there is agreement between the four uh, published data sets. So the data is reproducible. And for somebody who's been doing genomics for a living, it's actually very surprising how reproducible this data is. So what did we learn? The first thing is uh, the first paper uh, uh, from Sasha Misharan's group. Uh, and a later paper by Bob Lafayette's group really focused on uh, profibrotic macrophages. And our data, many, many more, more tissues basically said profibrotic macrophages are here to stay. And uh, I won't go into this in detail, but I say that if we look at the macrophages in the IPF lung, there's a distinct population. What you see here is basically all the inflammatory cells colored by uh, diseases. Um, IPF is red, COPD is yellow, and controls are blue. And basically, uh, there's a unique population of macrophages really enriched in the IPF lung. Uh, 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 you see this red and closed by a green uh, thing. And when you look at these cells, they have unique markers, MMP9, phosphopontin, L1RN, um, TIMP1, uh, CHI3L1, and also potentially uh, CCL2. And when we looked at the data for, that was published in other papers, this is the uh, uh, Sharon paper, this is uh, uh, the, the Banovich's data, we find the same thing. So there is a unique population of profibrotic macrophages uh, um, that is uh, um, uh, in the IPF lung and these are not available. 
when we uh, sort of do an arc, uh, an arch type analysis, try to see are the unique population. Basically, we could take only in this case only the monocytic cells or so monocytic cells in the IPF, uh, in the IPF COPD and control lungs, monocytes and microphages, and you could see that um, if you color them by the disease, again, blue is control, COPD is yellow, and red is IPF. It's sort of uh, almost like a, uh, um, uh, an axis of IPFness, of fibrosisness of, of macrophages, an axis of normalness of uh, 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 um, macrophages, and sort of an axis of uh, um, COPDness, for a lack of a better word, which is mostly monocytic. And then when we translate this into a pseudo time analysis, in which you assume that these shifts are actually uh, as if they were shifting time, you see distinct uh, uh, changes. And you can see that sort of the profibrotic macrophages, uh, this is the heat map of the uh, macrophages. Again, red is uh, increased, yellow is increased, and uh, purple is decreased. Uh, and uh, the distance is colored by the diseaseness of the constant. The disease is basically, again, red is uh, IPF, yellow is um, um, COPD and um, blue is control. You can see that basically the red area uh, is this right uh, quadrant. And this is characterized by a unique um, population of uh, macrophages that express uh, uh, this set of biomarkers that, that uh, I mentioned before. The other thing is when you look at it, and you, if you compare it to, let's say, the left quadrant in which you see a very, very unique population, you can see that there is a gradient. And this is really important. So not all porphyrobotic macrophages are the same. And I sort of highlighted it. I call it the smoking gun of macrophages. And there may be actually a subpopulation. We may need to look at it, or these may represent distinct uh, function. And this is clear. And this is where I like to see, again, the three, the image. Basically, you can see that the macrophages that express MRTK are not necessarily overlapping with the ones that express osteopontin or, or um, YKL40 or uh, uh, MMP9. So again, it's really important to think about it. I'm not the macrophage biologist, there's much smarter people than I am, but I think there's a lot to study. And when you're thinking about targeting population, potentially you may need to target subpopulation of the person. Um, lesson number two is there's some weird epithelial cells out there. This is clear. IPF is, uh, you know, even when you look at bulk RNA, it's clear that there's some different. So the first thing you can see is basically there's a shift from alveolar to bronchial epithelial cells in the distal lung in IPF. So remember, we're analyzing only distal lung, not airways. But what you see is a decline in type 1 and type 2 epithelial cells, an increase in basal ciliated club and global cells. And if you look at the sort of the relative fraction, so basically there's a shift from uh, control um, to IPF with a dramatic increase in sort of uh, bronchial epithelial cells. Um, this is also, you can see it also in uh, um, the other data set. So this is a, a really a replicated uh, uh, signal. So there is a shift. Um, and, you know, pathologists have called this bronchialization. The other thing that we can see is basically there is a previously undescribed epithelial cell population. So if you look at the heat map on the left, this is the known epithelial cell type in the lung and their markers. Um, and what we found that there was actually another uh, grouping of epithelial cells that was very distinct from all of the others. It was really epithelial, so expressed the uh, EPCOM and others, but also expressed other molecules. And actually, when we look at sort of uh, uh, clustering, a uh, UMAP clustering of uh, uh, these cells, they fell, fell all in a very distinct area. You see this sort of horn uh, uh, that is uh, encircled with a yellow light, only in IPF, uh, mostly. And we sort of call them aberrant basalates. So. so what are these cells? So if you look at their markers, these cells express uh, both epithelial cell markers 
uh, senescence marker, progenitors markers, uh, and, uh, um, and known markers of IPF. When we stain for a combination of markers, uh, both markers for uh, basal salt, like keratin 763, uh, um, uh, uh, senescence markers like P21 and HNJ2, we basically see that these cells are the epithelial cells that are um, adjacent to myofibrobasposite. So the cells that we used to call hyperplastic or flattened uh, type 2 cells are basically enriched with these sort of airway basalates, uh, aberrant basalate cells. And they're really interesting. They're definitely epithelial. They carry some basal cell markers, but miss others. They express extracellular matrix uh, and EMT markers, uh, fibronectin, collagen one, um, uh, and encoderin. They express some senescence markers, definitely P16, P21. They are able to activate TGF beta. They have the uh, profibrotic integrin alpha beta 6. Um, they have MMP7 that I mentioned, is a very strong marker of PF. They have AGM, AGMGA to another market. And it's interesting, they also carry transcriptional networks of, of progenitor cell. And this is just to show you how high the expression of these markers is compared to any other cell. So these are the mysterious epithelial cells at the edge of the myofibrosis. Um, and we want to validate everything. So we looked at it, and they definitely show up in other uh, data sets, both the uh, uh, um, uh, Nick Benovich, John Kropsky, uh, Harbourman uh, data set, and uh, uh, the, the Sasa Bishari data set. So they're real. The other thing we show, there's actually some out of place endothelial cells. And I'll go a little bit quicker on this because we're still trying to understand what it is. And basically, on a show, when it looked and classified the endothelial cell, notice that Beyond the usual and known endothelial cells, capillary, arterial, venous, we saw this unique, and you can see it in the right hand um, uh, uh, marker, a unique um, population of uh, uh, endothelial cells that were really increased in the IPF one. And when he looked at their markers, they carried many markers that were shared with uh, 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 other endothelial cells, including. Uh, venous and uh, capillary markers, but they also carried collagen 50, which we did not see in any other endothelial cell. When uh, Jonas did staining, and basically you can see on, uh, on the IPF, on the right hand, you can see IPF tissue, uh, co-staining with CD31 in brown and collagen 15 A1 in red, you can see a lot of cells expressing uh, both of these two markers. Uh, you can see them when you uh, stay in a bronchus. You never see them in the peripheral lung and control lung. And indeed, when we uh, uh, use the sort of the uh, uh, um, data set from uh, Vieira Braga, which uh, uh, um, was uh, uh, kind enough to share with us, we saw the same thing. Uh, in the normal lung, collagen 15 is only expressed in endothelial cells in the airway. So that's clearly a new population of cells. The last uh, lesson that I want to mention is that what we may think about fibroblasts in IPF is probably not necessarily um, as clear as we thought. Our group found basically two large groups of fibroblasts, one which we called myofibroblasts. I think it's a misnomer. However, they were characterized by having um, um, cytoskeletal and um, sort of um, uh, uh, smooth muscle markers. They were clearly distinct. If you look at the sort of the clustering of fibroblast-like uh, uh, cells, there's basically two large chunks in this uh, image. It looks like a cat. The brown is fibroblast-like, and the purple is myofibroblast-like. Maybe they should be called the official fibroblast. It's a really nice uh, paper from the Shepherds group recently discussing the, or the providing an atlas of collagen producing cells and mostly in the mouse model. Uh, when you look at the distribution by cells, there's sort of both cell population appear in all three populations, but 
the sort of the microglass like cells are higher in the disease. And there's seven clusters, but you know, numbers of clusters. What we were really fascinated to see is basically that these two populations were really distinct. So if we looked at the number of edges and the string of edges between the different clusters we observed, basically the edges within cell type were much stronger than across cell type, regardless of the disease. And this is just a different way of looking at this, doing an arch type analysis. And basically, again, you could do, uh, this is the edge of fibrosis for the two populations. This is the edge of no fibrosis. And you could sort of do a pseudo time analysis going from no fibrosis to fibrosis. And when you plot it now, you could see there, there's basically distinct uh, 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 markers and the sort of the idea, uh, the myofibroblasts uh, move from uh, one transcription or program to another uh, towers disease with an increase in collagen gene expression and increase in actually uh, MMP14 in the transcriptional regulation of twist one. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, the IPF fibroblasts also shift and there may be more population, I'm not sure that they, from a transcription or uh, uh, program that's uh, regulated by SFRP2 and WISP2 to more again collagen uh, fibronectin, but also um, hyaluronin synthase. Again, these things are a little bit surprising, but they actually fit what we've known in the literature. And the main thing is that arch type analysis suggests a continuous fibrosis related trajectory within those two large potential cell types, but not across. Is there a way we could start thinking about reversing all these anomalies? So for this, we apply the gene, a cell gene regulatory network. This is really, again, very important, by, mostly by uh, Jonas and Taylor Adams, in which you could look at uh, the transcriptional regulatory uh, networks in control and IPF lungs. I won't go in detail. I, I'll just say that you can almost see that these, uh, um, while the I control lung is much more balanced, the IPF lung is very fragmented and dominated by these aberrant um, uh, cell population. But what you, is cool, you can now look at targets for interventions and see, could we normalize it? This was done by Jonas, and basically there are compounds that will reverse the phenotype of uh, aberrant basaloid uh, cells. And there are compounds based on the literature that will reverse IPF myofibroblasts to fibroblasts uh, and fibroblasts. There is some overlap and that's you know the key signal to give beta FPF, but actually some of them do not overlap, which would suggest that you will need potentially combination therapies or therapies that have multiple targets to actually start with programming the lung. So what is, do we think is happening in the lung? And this is sort of starting to demystify pulmonary fibrosis um, and revisiting the GIF I showed you before. It's basically, this is the sort of a very generalized uh, view of the lung done by Arnaud or uh, 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 in which you have ciliated cells, uh, uh, basal cells and flop cells in the airway. Uh, then you have the sort of the alveolar unit with very simplified uh, way. You get recurrent injury and potential death type one epithelial cells. This requires compensation potentially by the local progenitor, the type two epithelial cells. But if this progenitor is tired, a week has the R stress of carry as short telomere. Um, it potentially fails, uh, induces the R stress, releases dumps in mitochondrial DNA, and start activating other cell types. Um, you get the activation of fibroblasts and uh, uh, recruitment of myofibroblasts, stiffening of the extracellular matrix. You get um, activation of prophibotic macrophages. But what is really important is that this failure of a progenitor cell, the failure to replenish the type one, potentially tells the lung, we need to activate a more primordial uh, program of building the lung. And that's where we start seeing this uh, uh, migration of uh, uh, basal cell uh, uh, progenitor cells and the building of an abnormal lung. And that potentially explains why we see endothelial cells that should be in the bronchus, why we see ciliated cells or other things. So you could envision that what we all look at 
a sort of function bone cancer disease, honey comes to this or others, it basically failed reactivation of developmental pathways in potentially the context of senescence. So the way we want to look at IPF, the IPF lesion is really a proximalization of the distal lung, a result of um, a misactivated or um, missing blue uh, and uh, uh, rebuilding of them. Um, so we are really into data sharing, but actually when I was looking at it, I thought this, this reminded me something that I started my career. Uh, basically, um, um, many years ago, I, I think it was 2005 or six, I made a joke uh, uh, that I discovered a new clinical syndrome on genomic data. And basically, um, Colin Bingo wrote uh, an uh, editorial that actually put my joke into uh, publication. And basically, um, uh, um, I described the sort of two conditions. One is acute gene-less staring syndrome, and the other one is chronic gene-less staring syndrome. Both conditions are characterized by sleep deprivation, refusal to return to the bench, and excitement about funny gene names. But the chronic condition may also be involved paralysis of the career what is now called Kaminsky tetrad. And now with single cell data, we definitely see it showing, uh, see it coming back. Uh, thousands of people are using the IPF cell atlas, losing a really important time for sleep and, and rest. So my recommendation, don't really stare at the genes. Look at the data, think function biology, disease rodents, and do follow-up experiments. So what did we learn? One is the data is really reproducible. The data makes sense. We learned that there's a big change in cell populations in the IPF that we suspected, but not necessarily the way we suspected it. So there's distinct populations of cells we did not really identify before. We've gotten this conceptual framework of um, proximalization of the distal lung and the shift of cell and gene regulatory effort. And of course, AGLSS and CGLSS are back. Um, this work was done by, um, um, really an amazing uh, group of people. I mentioned several of them. I, I want to highlight actually the importance of collaboration. And uh, um, one of the coolest things that happened was actually um, um, when we presented this, this, this data and put it in the public domain, we were contacted by other groups to said, oh, we have this same data. And with Nick Vanovich and John Kropsky and Ivan Rosas, we basically decided that we are going to coordinate it. Are. So instead of competing, we collaborate. And when we posted the data on bar archives we, and even did a social media sharing, we put it just out there um, uh, at exactly the same thing. And I think the power of our community is by really sharing forces and coordinating. Doesn't necessarily mean you lose your identity, you just push out the same direction. So a lot of amazing collaboration, uh, um, you know, um, some really superb uh, uh, computational people that I didn't mention every, uh, all of them, um, lab members. And, um, you know, in good times every year, we do a party outside of my house, celebrating the people who are leaving our lab and uh, the people who are staying and coming to the lab. Um, you know, I did, hopefully we will be able to do uh, another one of these gatherings in the summer because really, um, it's about the team and our strength is the team. So I'll stop here and take any other questions you may have. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Kaminsky for joining us today and uh, for the excellent talk, shedding light on the values of both bulk RNA-seq and the single cell RNA-seq technology. Um, and yeah, we'll open up the floor to any questions. We do have one that's been typed out, just raise your hand and we'll allow you to talk, but we do have one that's typed out. Um, they asked, why did defensins go down so much on the DREM model for IPF? They went from upregulated to downregulated according to the Y axis. What is this saying about innate immunity in the system? Was this linked to the uh, POU domain class two associating factor one? Um, so um, uh, one is in biology, we never can answer the, re the question why. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> So if we're thinking about how, um, in a sort of more simplistic way, is um, 
I think that this is a, a reflection of the decrease in inflammatory cells, uh, uh, mostly innate immune uh, uh, cells in, um, in the IPF lung. Um, if you look at sort of as the uh, IPF lesion, um, basically it's really protected. Um, the other thing is uh, actually over the years we've seen that there is some change in the expression in epithelial cells. I don't think it relates to POW2F1. It's sort of a different pathway. Uh, POW2F1 regulates sort of the increased prophybrotic uh, uh, tract. Um, I think it has to do more with the shift in, cell popul in, in cellular population. Um, Yana Shift, uh, together again with uh, John McDonough and uh, Farida Angari and, uh, and our collaborators, uh, uh, are starting to do nuclear seek in the same samples that we did the microenvironment, and this will allow us to sort of maybe clear this question. Great, thank you. Um, and we have a question from Toyoshi. So, um, hello. Yes. Yeah, so oh, we can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing the wonderful data. My name is Toyoshi, um, ex postdoc in Martin Kozla. I I got uh, several questions, but because of the limited limited time, I just would like to ask you one question. Um, have you investigated the single cell RNA sequence on the lung of acute exacerbation of IPF? Um, because uh, acute exacerbation is uh, like a big problem in the IPF, so I. I'm very interested in the pathogenesis of acute exacerbation. So um, we did not yet. Uh -huh. uh, all the data we used was uh, explained. Um, and, we did this paper uh -huh. almost, um, mm -hmm. I don't remember if this was 10 years ago or something like this, as we did uh -huh. uh, um, on acute exacerbation, which actually showed mm -hmm. that it was relatively similar except mm -hmm. actually upregulation of defense in this case. Mm -hmm. um, if we are confident that uh, we may go back to the same samples uh -huh. that are still at Pittsburgh and maybe do nuclear seek on them uh, in the future. Uh, um, again, to get tissues of patients with acute exacerbations, you usually need to do a warm mm -hmm. autopsy protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, but we would, I think it makes a lot of sense to do that. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and there is a question about myeloid cell population. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so um, there's a question, wouldn't patients with a predominant myeloid cell population benefit from anti-inflammatory therapy? Um, at least partial benefit, almost all other disease do. So one is I would argue that the last infant is actually not true. Um, the question is, what is the myeloid cell population and what is its phenotype? Um, as um, uh, we have seen, actually, uh, the IPF macrophages um, are potentially a unique, um, um, how would you say, um, population of cells of activated monocytes that are being recruited into the lung and undergoing this change. I think if you normalize their phenotype, you will affect disease progression. But I don't think that any of our usual um, um, run-of-the-mill anti-inflammatory therapies will do it. In fact, I think that some of them may actually exacerbate um, uh, um, the problem with the macrophages. So what you would need is if you want to affect inflammation, if you want to affect the macrophage phenotype, you either need to affect the signaling, uh, the immune signaling that activates this um, monocytes and macrophages, potentially a unique population of regulatory T cells or something else. And we actually have some data to support it um, and uh, or normalize them or prevent their activation or migration from the blood in another way. Uh, but I don't think the sort of general, what we call anti-inflammatory therapy would be helpful. And we also know that um, steroids and uh, azathioprine definitely kill the patients with IPF. So it's gonna be much more targeted. 
Uh, and then as the uh, as the question that uh, Melissa has about which cell types start for modeling or repair to cure IPS, uh, I really think it's, you know, in some ways that the stage we see the patients is probably all of them. So we basically need to um, cut down this, um, um, how would we say it? This uh, um, abnormal um, remodeling process that, um, or um, um, feed forward loop that basically drives, drives the lung to keep building itself. Um, I think early on, if we prevent the death of type 1 epithelial cells, uh, probably um, uh, we prevent the progression of the disease. I doubt that this, after the matrix gets different, I don't think uh, we can target one cell type. Um, so I think we should start to wrap up a little bit. We did have one more question in the comments from Dr. Lopker. Um, they say, thank you for your excellent presentation. Are these cell changes and phenotypic shifts linked to inhaled environmental toxins? And if so, do we know of one or more specific environmental toxins associated with these cellular changes? Maybe this will be our last question. Yeah, so I love this question. And the reason I love it, because there's been so much focus about genetics and IPF and actually not enough focus about environmental exposures. Uh, we know, um, we know that IPF is basically uh, um, um, it is strongly genetically determined. Even the sporadic disease, around 30 to 40 percent of the patients have gene variants that are associated with the disease. But it's not deterministic, and it is gene environment uh, uh, interaction. Uh, we know the disease is associated with mild smoking, and you know, and fibrosis in general. There's very dust. Uh, the question is, this is like um, uh, this repeated injury that kills the type 1 uh, uh, cells or, you know, or changes the microbiome and impairs recovery or other ways. We don't really know. I really think that this is a, an important field of research. Um, just to give you a simple example more from the real life. So patients with IPF are worried about disease progression. They've heard me say a lot of time um, uh, in response to other questions that you should only inhale clean air and worried about their health. They say, how do I inhale clean air if, if I live in uh, Toronto or uh, New York or actually everywhere? And, and they ask us about uh, house filters or air purifiers and we don't have an answer. So one approach would be actually clinical perspective trials that look whether air purifiers affect the health of patients with IPF or, um, and if we see a difference there, then we could make a more distinct statement about specific environmental exposures. But I've no doubt that the environment is the biggest uh, understudied area in pulmonary fibrosis. Great. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Kaminsky. Uh, thank you for answering those questions. And I think we'll wrap up the session here. Uh, it was an excellent talk again, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone.